happy Easter to you and to all you all, wherever you are, whoever you are, whether you're Catholic or Christian or no, or not. So happy Easter to you. And this is the season, the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad because humanity, humankind no longer has to fear death. We have a solution for death, and that's why we are celebrating. And mm -hmm. uh, we are sending you individually and to your family these blessings from the risen Lord. And we continue to follow the footsteps of the risen one by studying him. We are entering into the holy land of the sacred scripture, the Bible, especially the gospel. So. We begin this uh, phase EBS, phase Zoom Bible study with a prayer. And I would like to invite that you could turn to your handy iPhone, iPad, PC on this um, website called PC, papameo.org. And you just put it up. You see that's the Pentecost and then the second heart, and then you see Jesus holding the Eucharistic species, the bread and the wine, the body and the blood, and touching. And one more, only twice, you see, I did not listen to the voice of Moses. You only touched once. But now you have the prayer, okay? It's like from the rock, the tablet, water flows. So the prayer is right there. It's called a prayer for priests. And so let us pray this prayer. Hey, and I would like to invite uh, Guju. Do you have the prayer with you, ma'am? Yes. Okay. So would you like to lead us in prayer? Okay. Let us do it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty, eternal God, look upon the face of Christ, and for the love of him, who is the eternal high priest, have mercy on your priests. Remember, O most compassionate God, that they are but weak and frail human beings. Stir up in them the grace of their vocation, which is bestowed on them by the imposition of the bishop's hands. Keep them close to you, lest the enemy prevail against them, so that they may never do anything in the slightest degree unworthy of their sublime vocation. O oh, Jesus, I pray for your faithful and fervent priests, for your unfaithful and tepid priests, for your priests laboring at home or abroad in distant mission fields, for your tempted priests, for your lonely priests, for your young priests, for your aged priests, for your sick priests, for your dying priests, for the souls of your priests in purgatory. But above all, I recommend to you the priest dearest to me, the priest who baptized me, the priest who absolved me from my sins, the priest at whose masses I assisted and who gave me your body and blood in holy communion the priest who taught and instructed me or helped me and encouraged me, all the priests to, who who, to whom I am indebted in any other way, particularly. Pray for Pope Francis and all the Papa priests and your particular, uh, whoever you know who is in need right now. Continue, please. O oh, Jesus, keep them close to your sacred heart and bless them abundantly in time and eternity. Amen. Amen. O oh, Mary, Queen of the Apostles. Make your priest, make your priest holy. O oh, Mary, Queen of the Apostles. Make your priest, your priest holy. O oh, Mary, Queen of the Apostles. Make, make your, priest your priest holy. Then John Vianney. Pray for Pray us. Pray for us. And Alphonsus. Pray for, Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Okay, once again, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night, and uh, bonjour, bonsoir, bon nuit, buongiorno, buenos dias. Okay. We are studying the scripture, and this is the way we do it. We will divide this study session into three parts, three phases, okay? Phases are three phrases of phases. Okay, P H A S E S. -S okay. Number one, I will summarize the first all the readings. So we are using or uh, choosing the readings of the previous Sunday, which is Easter Sunday, right? Year B. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I will some I will do uh, I will do a summary, so a synopsis of the readings. And then I will proclaim the gospel. Then we move to the second phase, which is you, it's your turn to report whatever you heard during the homily, whoever was the homilist, okay? Uh, on YouTube, on in your local uh, church, wherever, okay? And then we go to the third phase, we will be studying the gospel itself, okay? Now, that's the... Uh, how we're going to approach this, the material and the how. We go into the, the, the specific. This is the method we are going to study. We're studying it so it is not a sharing of experience, the emotion. We don't need to emote here. That's a sharing experience where we are studying. So we're going to use our mind, our heart, and also our spirit to study the word of God. And therefore, therefore we... Um, apply the critical method of uh, thinking or corrective thinking or questioning. To think is to question, to think is to solve problems, okay? And um, our problem is uh, the meaning. We are looking or seeking for the meaning, okay? And meaning could only be found in the context. There are many contexts in your life. Right now, you're sitting your own home and your maybe living room or bedroom or library or your school or wherever in Washington DC or are you still in Washington DC Olivia home wherever you are okay so you know the context and you know the environment the season the time also the temporal context the spatial context and the context will give you the interpretation of um, whatever is said or spoken all right and that means we are discovering the scripture, you know, by ourselves, by discussing and by discussions, okay? And we we'll study only the gospel, the third part, okay? So let's get straight to the beginning. Start, let's start from the beginning. This is the reading from the uh, Sunday, Easter Sunday. And we have... Uh, this is Sunday, the 30, uh, 31st, March 2024. Okay, we'll talk about how we, how we um, time and how we name things, okay, later. But let's go to the first reading. This is the Act of the Apostle. How many days was it? We have to ask the context of time, temporal context. Peter proceeded to speak and said, you know, what had hap has happened all over Judea. Okay. So now the context is this. This is 50 days already after the resurrection, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. 10 days after the Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. Okay, so this is the Pentecost here. And uh, the context, this right before that, Peter and the um, other apostles have received the Holy Spirit. Okay. And then uh, he came out to uh, speak to the crowds, the mob, those who wanted to make Jesus their king. And the same group of people who wanted to kill Jesus, crucify Jesus. Yeah, crucified him. And then this is the same group, the same group of people who wanted to 
repent. So you could see in this reading, the Acts of the Apostle chapter 10 here, the same group of people, number one, they want power, they want uh, privileges. When Jesus is good, has the power to um, create miracles, right? Perform miracles. And then when they, they didn't have it, they want to kill him because they see somebody stronger, more powerful than him, like the Romans, then, you know, um, legions and Pontius Pilate and Caiaphas and his uh, priests, like more powerful. And then you see, after they agree, they condone, they uh, endorse the killing of Jesus, the, crucif uh, the crucifying of Jesus. They were guilty. They were ashamed. And then somebody came out and spoke to him. Now, the point of this is important. This person who had committed no wrong, said nothing wrong, did nothing wrong, all good, but they killed him because he said he's God. The problem is this, after he came back to life, after he came back from the dead, he forgives. That's the problem. That's the biggest problem. And people were afraid. He is the reason. And he's come back to revenge. No, that is not a message. That is not a good news. You have heard of all the stories of many, many heroes. You know, they were enslaved, they were tortured, everything else, and they, you know, they got back. They regained their force and their strength, and they regained their army, and they went back and they revenged. They paid pay vengeance, and they destroyed their enemies. But this is not the same story as we still have it everywhere. Okay, you hurt me, you hurt my family and my clans and uh, my uh, countrymen and my own country, homeland. And then uh, we're going to withdraw. We go into the jungle and the mountain. And we will recuperate, we're going to reinforce, and we come back, we're going to kill you. That's human. Still, we're doing it. But the story of, um, of Jesus, Peter, is reporting it. No, 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 no. The problem is this, he forgives. He came back not to revenge. He came back to call for repentance. Okay, that's the whole point. That's why they say, what should we do? What should we do? And Peter said, well, get baptized. Depend and get baptized. Okay? And receive forgiveness through his name. Second reading. The psalm, response or psalm. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in him. And be glad in him. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be You know that song. <laughs> <laughs> you know the theme already. Just giving thanks because he's merciful. Yeah, he's coming back not to punish or to revenge. He's coming back to forgive. Same theme. Okay. Same theme and see how merciful, how, how merciful the Lord, how compassionate God is. He understands. Even though we rejected him, okay, the um, the stone that the um, builder rejected has become the cornerstone. On top of the building, the cornerstone is the stone that is on top, not at the corner, on top. That had that uh, glue or that put everything together. Without the cornerstone, the roof is going to fall. Okay? So the cornerstone, he is the cornerstone. Okay, that's the second reading. The uh, third reading is Colossians chapter 3. Okay. This is the problem again for us. It is impossible for us not to think of earthly matter, worldly matter, because we are made up of earth. And we are living in the world. So we tend to cling to what is close to us. And we rely on them. 
and we find uh, safety and security in them. We use them as our protection. So there are three, th four things, or maybe five things that we need, just uh, bare essentials we need to live in this uh, world, clothes to wear, or put food to eat, water, or um, something to drink, a medicine to drink, air to breathe, um, a place to live, to reside, and clothes to wear. Those are the five essential things. If you have more than those, extra more than those, well, you, go, you are inviting misery. <laughs> no? Only five, right? Food, drink, food, drink, air to breathe, clothes to wear, and places to live, a roof over your head. Five. And all industries and you know, technology serve these five things. Food, drink, air, clothes, and a place to stay. And that's how you build your family and your life. Hmm. But we get more than that. Well, that, that is, uh, you don't see that in the animals. The animals, they don't need clothes. They have shell or fur, no problem. They could stay anywhere. They could make their nests, right? Air mm -hmm. and food, they have to, air is provided for them. They only look for water and food. So they live on the two. The other things are provided for them. Human being, we make these things, you know, clothes and uh, uh, air, we have to have fresh air, fragrant air. Uh, clothes is important. Yeah, we, we make everything complicated. If you live like the, in the animal kingdoms, food and water is essential. You could sleep anywhere, right? So well, our life is miserable because we, we want more and we're so stuck with these. And now Paul said, seek something that is in heaven above us. Hmm. In heaven, you won't need clothes. You don't need a place to stay. Mm -hmm. Well, air is always there. No food, no drink anymore. All the you know five essential you know of the human life in here, our life here, no need. Think of things that are above. Think of what is above, not what on earth. Hmm. Something to think about. What do you have up there? Hmm. So you wear something. Uh, uh, is this dress uh, uh, appropriate for me with the occasion <laughs> or face BS? <laughs> this is this, this makeup uh, uh, fits with the season of the time, springtime and Easter time. So you don't worry about those things anymore because you're already beautiful. However you are, whatever is inside is outside, outside is inside. So think about those. You have no worries. The five essentials on this earth, in this life, no longer, well, they are obsolete, no longer matter. Hmm. Something to think about. Okay, because we have the life, the resurrection, and let's move to the, well, we have the sequence, right? The sequence in uh, during this week, octave of Easter, which means the whole week is uh, every day is a Sunday, like Easter. So every day at Mass, you do read the sequence, right? Victime Pascali Laudes. Every day, right? You attend Mass, they read this? Yes, no? No. no. Every day should be uh, like a Sunday during this week. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's why we we uh, we say the uh, glory, the Gloria, mm -hmm. and we say this one, okay. So this is um, a praise, ancient praise. Interesting. We could study this for a long time, okay. And one of the um, thing that is so uh, striking is that the Lamb redeems the sheep, the flock. Mm. That's quite quite interesting. When we have time, we study that prayer or that. We call it doxology, okay, the glory. So let's move to the from? cross. 
Huh? Where does the sequence come from? I have to get back to you on that. Okay. It comes from the church. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, we'll get to the bottom of that when we study it. Okay, right now, just study the word of God, the gospel, the Bible. Okay. I'm going to re, um, I will proclaim for you the gospel according to Mark chapter 16, verse 1 to 7, seven verses. Okay. Are we ready? Yes. Mark chapter 16. The Lord be with you all. And with your, with spirit. your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. To you, o Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Very early, when the sun has risen, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb. They were saying to one another, who will roll back the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. On entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a white robe, and they were utterly amazed. He said to them, do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him, but go and tell his disciples and Peter he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him and as he told you. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So let's move to the second phase. We have only three phases in this second phase. And we would like to invite Gertrude to, to share what you have gathered during, uh, during this uh, Pascal or Easter Sunday from your church or from the internet. Uh, please report the point that is relevant to all of us and to you. And so, did you get a chance to go to church, go to, or you were in the hospital? Can we hear you? Could we hear you? I went to okay. church. Um, okay. But um, I'm using the uh, uh, mass that I Zoomed later because it was Father Dad and it was the pastor. So, mm -hmm. I want to hear his homily. Um, the what of the, and we're doing all of them or just the gospel reading? Oh, well, you, uh, the homily, okay. You do the, the homily, homily. Okay. All okay. right. Okay, summarize we'll the homily, the point. See, they're the cutting the grass, so my dog is barking. Oh, okay. Right. We can't okay. hear it. Okay. All right. Well, the, the what for me, um, well, the what from Father Dad is, he started off with, uh, he is risen. The Lord is risen. Um, and that the disciples, they saw the empty tomb and they saw and they believed. So that was, that was the what of it. The disciples saw the tomb and they believed. And, and the message was that, uh, that Christ is risen. The now what uh, from for Father Dadis, he said, we have to go out to the whole world proclaiming the empty tomb and the resurrection. And that life is stronger than death. And the tomb is empty to show us that 2,000 years later, 
we see the Lord as alive and in our midst today. And the so what um, from Father Dad is, the Lord is alive and that he is called to share the Easter message with others to share the message with the world. Now I go into my, my now what or the whole thing. The what for me is that Jesus is risen from the dead. This is the Easter season. This is the message. Um, um, so I am to be a disciple of Christ and to share that Christ is written, risen message. So I'm called to be a disciple. So that is the now what for me. And so, so what? Um, that I'm called to, to be Jesus' eyes and ears and his hands and his feet and his heart, the heart of love. As a disciple of the Lord, I look to guidance from my Lake Carmelite community and from the Papa apostolate. I use those as my guideposts for what discipleship is to be like for me because I need help along the way. And, um, and I also do that by seeking to live out my discipleship either in sickness or in health and to try to follow God's will for my life. And the main thing is to love and to serve. Wonderful. Thank you, good dude, for sharing. Thank you for the dot. Yes. Empty tomb. The Lord is risen. We are called to be his disciples and to proclaim the good news that the Lord is risen. They saw and they believed. Hmm. And uh, we follow as disciples. In many ways of spirituality, the Papa spirituality or the Carmelites. Wonderful. Okay. Now, I'm going to um, have my uh, response to this. Good. What I'm going to uh, just share is um, the usual normal for all Catholics and for Christians. We're not speaking to, we're not preaching to the choir, we're not speaking to just Catholics. So when we read the part where you know, Peter and uh, John and the ladies went to the tomb, they saw the tomb, then they saw and they believed. Uh, John said he saw and he believed. Believe what? Does it make sense to the non-Christian? You know, we have 8 billion people around the world. Only 2.4 billion are Christians. And try to talk to the 6 billion people. They're saying, I saw and I believe. Believe what? Does it make sense? We believe that therefore it makes, it makes sense to us. And if we talk to uh, the people at church, no problem. Catholics, no problem, because the Father said so. And we have uh, repeat, kept repeat, keep repeating this message uh, for years and years and years. How many years already? And so we accept it at face value. But how about talking sense here? That's why we are critical, at not at anybody else, but at what we proclaim or we assert. Oh, the empty tomb, nobody there. And we cannot find the body. And uh, so we believe. That's crazy. And it makes sense to us. Why don't you believe? We believe. Why don't you believe? What do we believe? We believe. Oh, you go to a cemetery and you see the empty tomb and you say, oh, that person is already risen from the dead. That's crazy. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. It's not real, realistic. It is not practical. 
just we we go out and we no we're not I'm gonna proclaim this the way if this is the way we proclaim the gospel we're in trouble we are only proclaim the gospel in church mm -hmm. try to go outside and and then let people attack you for whatever you believe you have to have uh, reasons you know so let's think about this okay so what is the meaning of that empty tomb and why do we believe that it means that jesus is risen it could mean that jesus is not risen as well hmm. so we have to go study it deeply okay not with emotion because we have been more normally because people reject our uh, assertion we get emotional and we start to argue or scream and then we dismiss people and you go to hell and say, no 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 let's sit, let's sit down and have a talk and listen maybe i don't understand what i'm believing and this is the whole thing about discipleship being a disciple means being a student being a disciple means you have to have discipline and the discipline is simply sacrifice any kind of discipline entails and demands a sacrifice you sacrifice whatever assumptions we hold you know, we have to in order to seek the truth when you follow the truth you're going to have to discipline yourself. If we don't follow the way of the truth, then we're going to distort reality. And so whenever, whatever is not clear or confusing, we're going to stop and look in order to look, you know, to seek the truth. Hmm. So we, we, uh, we question everything without mercy, especially our assumption. And uh, when I mention faith is an assumption, faith is an assumption, belief is an assumption. Some people got so um, offended. And I'm talking about my faith here. So should our faith be just a mere assumption? Or should our faith be based not on assumption, but on reality, on facts, on evidence? Yes, Olivia. Uh, what, what's your definition of assumption, Father? Take a friend. We, we've studied this before. We have studied this in the, uh, the uh, nine pillars of uh, critical thinking, corrective thinking, thinking in order to think in order, while you're thinking in order to improve your thinking. Uh, one of the things is that we, uh, after we draw the conclusion or an inference, we have to look at the assumptions. Why did we draw the conclusion? Okay. So I say uh, four is um, two plus two. Yeah, the assumption that we know two and two. And we take it for granted. Some people just uh, take it for granted that uh, two plus two is four, right? And that's the whole world they could know and nothing else but two plus two is four. Okay, the result and, and then by memorization, by memory, However, somebody comes along and says, no, that's not the only way to get to four. You could plus, you know, uh, one minus plus five could be four. Yeah, negative one plus five is four. No? Yes? Yes. And people, the, the assumption we only have one. Maybe your, our assumption is correct, but it's only one. And so the assumption we defined it as when you take in things for granted they take it for granted yeah i assume that y'all are ladies and women and you're not men and uh, and and this is based on reality okay <laughs> not imagination and uh, i assume that all priests catholic priests are men not women based on reality yeah so uh, we take it for granted but many things we create take for granted which are not based on reality which is based on something that is either fake unreal or deceptions or lies 
no? Assumptions. So for scientists, when we make an assumption, it is always based on evidence or facts. Mm -hmm. And then we are not saying that my assumption, I take this for granted, my assumption is the ultimate truth. I'm going to, have to verify it or I'm going to falsify it. Yeah, I'm going yes. to falsify it. And so, so you have all these facts here, right? Evidence, and we put them together and we protect that this is going to be the result. Okay, one plus one is two, but then suddenly, well, something's wrong. Doesn't yield the result we want. So we go back to each of the assumptions or the interpretation of reality. Okay, we take it for granted. I assume that um, the sun will rise in the east and every day the sun will set in the West, so true. And we have spoken about this before. That assumption is only correct when you are within, you know, under or above the two poles, North and South Pole. If you stand, you live in the North Pole, South Pole, the sun will never set. <laughs> No? Right. And it doesn't rise from the east or west, anywhere as east, anywhere as west. Yeah, so assumption depends on where you are. Yeah. Mm. So that's why we, uh, we have to uh, raise the question about assumptions, include our faith. Okay, empty tomb. It means we just attribute it, we just give it a meaning. That's it. It means God is risen, yeah. Jesus is risen from that. Yeah. Let's take a look at it again. Otherwise, we don't know what we're talking about. And maybe we know what we're talking about, but by mere conviction, not by reason. And when we talk about conviction, we use authority, using authority to convince somebody. Yeah, it doesn't work for a long time. Uh, when some, they, they get more authority than you, than your authority the authority isn't, doesn't make it, make it right, you know, power and authority. Reasons make it right. And Jesus could use his authority. He's all powerful. You have to believe because I tell, tell you, to, you know, I tell you so. I'm God. But he did not use authority, that kind of authority. He used the authority of the truth. I want you to see it yourself. Discover it for yourself. Discipline yourself. Be like my disciple to study it with me and observe with your own senses, eyes and ears and you know, touch and smell and all taste and other things. And then you come to your own conclusion. That is appropriate to you. That is Christianity. That is discipleship. Even the saints, okay, they have their own ways and they're not perfect. All saints, all prophets. So only one perfect. Being is God, is Jesus. So everybody is a student, a disciple of Jesus. Okay? So a long response to the report from Gertrude. Okay? So since, thank you, Gertrude. Thank you for the dot. Let's move to Olivia, since you raised questions. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, so I always thought faith was something that was given to us by God. So. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and let's we have to explore it yeah why okay. is it an assumption why is not an assumption why right. is it a gift the grace of god theological the faith is a theological virtue why is it a virtue oh, okay so so many things to we make assumptions right just faith but faith, faith is grace and faith is given by god faith is a virtue not human virtue but theological virtue so why is it not a moral virtue why is it not human virtue but Theological virtue, right? And so, yes, many assumptions. We say we have the umbrella of faith, and that we're in trouble. Hmm. Our faith is very, uh, very um, realistic. And so, we have to understand what faith is. Yeah? Okay. All right. Let's uh, move to your report. 
or part. I went to uh, St. Matthew Cathedral in Washington, D.C., and the uh, priest was Father Raymond Jameson. Mm -hmm. And his first sentence was, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. And his last sentence was, um, God can raise us from the dark where we can find ourselves trapped. Jesus can lead us and he can do it right now. So basically, he said that the message of Easter sometimes flies in the face of human experience, uh, but that Easter uh, says everything is new and can be new because he has risen and everything is made new in the light of Christ's resurrection. And then he, he gave witness to the nine uh, uh, baptized Catholics uh, the, the night before uh, where they received a new life in Christ at the Easter vigil and that they were going to begin living in a new way. And so uh, his point was to us that we needed to believe that we can change thanks to the risen Christ, who is our witness and our motivation, and death will not have the final word. So the what for me is that I um, that Jesus has risen, as we all know, and I believe uh, that he is in our midst and that he is in each one of us and that we need to be glad and rejoice and um, look out for the newness in ourselves as well as in other people. The so what is I was with family for about 12 days. There was a lot of chaos, a lot of noise, a lot of um, lack of silence or solitude. So it, it brings me back to the reality of, of the 40 days of Lent and Easter that uh, I need to kind of relive Lent and Easter, more so Easter, uh, but to prepare myself again for the, uh, the new life that God has promised us uh, through his um, resurrection. And the now what is to do this for me, I just need to uh, read and and understand better the scripture and to uh, read and understand God's teachings and to never give up on each day is a new day. That was it. Okay. Let me respond. Thank you. Welcome. You pay attention, although you you enjoy your traveling and uh, vacation oh, yeah. <laughs> during while people are uh, meditating and uh, uh, fasting and uh, you know flatulating themselves. Yeah. yeah, and you enjoying hot dogs and no. New York. No, no hot dogs. Just enjoying family, you know. Family, but there was just okay. a lot of chaos. Just, I'm uh, just having fun. I know. With you. <laughs> so uh, uh, the season for joy. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, hi. Right. You believe in the new day? I, do I believe in the new day? Yes, definitely. But every day is a new day. It's not like one new day and then that's it. Every day is a new day. And at the end of the day, which, I go which, through my darkness. Which day is not a new day? The day that I wake up in the dark and don't bother to try to get out of it. That's it's not a new day. day also, but the dark new day. Right. You're right. <laughs> Every day is a new day anyway, but the new, uh, when we turn it dark with our mindset becomes ugly. It's a new day, but depends on how you treat it. Mm-hmm. But still, you still have the day. This is the day the Lord has made. But the day the Lord has made in this context is not just time. It's not in time. It's eternity. Oh, so when we sing that song, that psalms, this is the Lord, this is the Lord, this is the day the Lord has made. That day he makes, that's the day of the resurrection. It shatters time and space. Hmm. So we're thinking in the temporal, you know, spatial, space-time continuum. 
But when we read that part, it, it should be eternity. We call it a day. So, Yom, Yom, Hebrew, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, yeah, Yom. But the day could be, it could have, carry many, many senses, many meanings. But when we talk about this is the day the Lord has made, it is eternal. Something to think about. Yeah, that's my response. Okay. Yeah. And after that day, there's no more day. Hmm. Turn. <laughs> that's a problem. That's a problem <laughs> because the sun no, no longer rises and then sets, right? <laughs> because there's no sun. <laughs> no more sun to rise, to set. And no more earth like we know. So that's the problem. Yes. So the the world when I mean the world stops existing. No. When, no. There will be a sun. There will be a day and a night, won't it? Yeah, the stars and the like galaxy is still there, but we are a different plane now. We are not okay. no longer in the physical. We're talking about eternity, the day. Right. In that kind of life, the physical existence is like this. We are in this space time, physical uh, energy matter sphere. Okay. But part of us, major part of us, is spiritual, is in the other plane. Mm. Okay. And that's why this plane here is only temporary. This plane is, we are in this world, but we do not belong to this world. This is not our homeland. Yeah? Mm -hmm. This is not our homeland. So the Lord enter into this world. It is not his homeland. So when he takes us away, he pulls now the spirit. Our spirit is in the physical, you know, physical. But when we enter into eternal, the eternal, our body is gonna be in the eternal also. Also, yes, no. Mm -hmm. So very different. Yes. So the hub now the the soul is in this body, but in that in that reality, the body is gonna be inside the spirit. Wow. There's a reverse. That's why the body becomes immortal. But the soul is in here. That's why the soul is limited. Hmm. Oh, okay. So it's a reverse. It's like uh, turning outside in and inside out. Soul body, body soul. Now, right now, soul in the body, then it's going to be body in the spirit. That's why we keep saying, live in the spirit, live in the spirit. Mm -hmm. Eternal. The spirit is eternal. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, uh, the physical world sh should still be there. Mm -hmm. It is just a comparison, just like... um. We see other species. We are not the mosquitoes or the flies or the ants. But their universe is so different from ours. Look at ours. No? Yes. Yes. They're still there. But we're, we're not like, just like, okay, the grass, right? We're not them. And then uh, somehow it becomes a cow, the grass. Grass, are they or it? Is a pro or a singular? Them grass or mm -hmm. they grass or it grass? <laughs> it, the which grass. would which would the grass grass uh, identify itself with? They or he or she? <laughs> specified. So now suddenly becomes a cow, and the cow suddenly becomes human because we eat them. 
<laughs> so you know they they got uh, consumed and so the crust becomes human no oh, physically physically speaking right but they're no longer no longer crust the crust still there so you see you compare from the the process from a piece of a blade of grass uh, to the cow and to the table and to you right mm -hmm. and you're not the same but they're still there you see them still there. but they cannot see you i use a physical uh, physical uh, analogy to uh, just to compare that's why we have this discipline of thinking yeah okay. so this is the day different the way uh, from the way we think chronos or kairos yeah okay let's move to denise thank you alivia welcome father <laughs> okay so i am reporting on the homily from bishop robert Barron. um the what of the homily is faith the so what is that trying to understand the, the um, resurrection uh, or the time that they had in the tomb, trying to understand that in the context of the disciples. So... The so what is taking what the disciples learned when they were in the tomb and trying to um, see with my eyes and my mind uh, and help me to grow in my faith. Um, so that's the so what. And then the now what, I guess... Um, to meditate on the uh, disciples faith and how they came to learn all of about the resurrection so what father i mean bishop robert baron said is saint paul says if the lord is not raised our faith is in vain he recalled the the story where mary got, comes to the tomb before dawn and sees the stone rolled back she goes and tells the disciples well peter and john peter and john dash to the tomb john arrives first and why why do they include john arriving first what is the significance there's obviously something there and then he brought it to graham green uh and graham green said that Everything that is stated in this gospel reading is there so that we can vividly remember with the disciples. They noticed the burial cloth and the one around his head was rolled up in a, and folded up and put to the side. And he said, why is that uh, significant? And he said that uh, if Jesus was actually stolen, the cloth may have been with him, you know, gone with the body. So all of this was very peculiar, peculiar, he said, and it caught the attention of the disciples. And so we're trying to understand with the disciples how their faith in the resurrection came to be. So we're not just taking it for granted that they just automatically um, believed. And so he brought it to his own self where he got to visit the Shroud of Turin and how moving it was for him to see, actually see the burial cloth. And he said, this relic is the same relic that the disciples saw. And then he went into uh, explaining how the photographer, it was first photographer, there was a photographer that came and photographed it for the first time in 1898. And when he was developing the negative is when he noticed that the shroud was actually a negative. And so what scientists came to conclude was that there must have been 
some type of powerful radiation that caused, you know, this, this negative to just be embedded onto the cloth. And then he said, um, so, okay, so if it is so, why is this evidence of the resurrection? So he said that there were hours of scientific analysis that were done to try and recreate the Shroud of Turin and nothing, nothing could reproduce what had happened. And so the, the that intense burst of radioactive energy uh, produced the marks that you see now on the Shroud of Turin. And so, you know, these are all things that help us to come to believe, right? Um, because we don't automatically just believe. And the disciples didn't automatically just believe. It was a process. And we all have to go through that process. And he said that when he was young and coming of age, uh, there was a tendency for him to uh, think of the resurrection as a legend and all of the things that we do in mass as just a symbol. And he said, we live in a very skeptical time. And then he prayed for each of us to see with the eyes of our our faith and um come to believe with the same faith that the disciples had so that's his homily i'm sorry it was very long but it was so powerful uh, the bishop has many points many insights and uh, practical insight for us to uh, meditate to ponder yeah so now the whole point is faith is a process. You have to come to faith. Yeah, the whole process of uh, discovery, self-discovery. Right. Yeah. So you move from the childish uh, faith. You believe in miracles and rituals and like fairy tales. It could be a fairy tales, you know, fiction. We could write you know, mythology. We do have many many myths that have. Um, the gods raised from the dead mm. and the myths and the reality is this, this this is not a myth moving from a myth into a reality mm. this is this is mind-blowing and people keep saying this is a myth but is it a myth the myth of jesus the myth of the resurrection and in many cultures you do have the resurrection of the dead many but here, this is uh, this is historical. Um, the fact is that the disciples did not just believe in what they don't see. They did see what they believe. Mm -hmm. That is the distinction between us and them. They did touch Jesus. Mm -hmm. They did eat with him. Mm -hmm. They listened to him, they heard him, they saw him. They even tested him. You know, Thomas touched his heart and his wound. So their faith is reinforced by what they feel physically. So faith has, um, is a multi-dimensional reality. So you have, you, 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 we, have, we have at least seven dimensions, you know, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, yeah? And the mind thinking, reasoning, it makes sense. And then deeper, the seventh dimension is in the spirit. Yeah? So it, it takes a whole human experience. And uh, our naive, childish faith is based only for on faith, faith based on faith evidence. That's why we have Facebook. Anything that we see in movie, you say that's the truth on TV or news, the truth. We only believe what we see, but there, it's deeper than just what we see. Yeah? And that's childish faith. 
uh, only what we hear people say what others said. Oh, it's deeper. So it, it takes a holistic or the well-rounded experience of being human. So the Lord does not want us to have one dimension of faith. Hmm. Yeah. So now the bishop said, or whoever the Al Green, who were the um, the critics or the expert in the Bible or commentary in the Bible, say that uh, the cloth of Jesus was folded. Yeah, this is a detail. Yeah. My th my theory is very simple. <laughs> well, his theory is that if if they were to steal the body of Jesus, they should steal the the cloth as well, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, my 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 theory is very simple. When you wake up in the morning, make up your bed. That's all. Make your bed. Jesus woke all up. Right. Make his bed. <laughs> Jesus made his bed. That's the lesson. <laughs> he knows to make his bed and put everything neatly, <laughs> neatly folded. Yeah, they're neatly folded. That's why it is. And then there was this book that said, God loves an unmade bed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Oh, no, no, Jesus, no, Jesus made his bed. <laughs> tell, you know, tell everybody, all the children, grandchildren, you see, Jesus, you know, he woke up, he made his bed <laughs> neatly folded, you know, in the proper place. So, so that's the, so many, many ways. Okay. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Bishop. Let's go study it. Okay. And uh, we have many things to study here. Context. Very important. Since we are living in space and in time, and we're not just talking in the generic, generic sense of space and time, we divide space and time into seasons and for, not for us now, but for many cultures, time and space is divided according to the rituals, the celebrations of worship. The reason for having the months and the seasons and the, celebra the holidays is because of the holidays. For worship. All cultures, time was invented just to worship. You know that? Oh, well, this is a season of you know, the equinox or whatever. This is a season um, uh, the sun is going to be longer, day is going to be longer than the night, and we have the day that the sun is about to beat the darkness, right? And so we have a celebration to thank whatever the god of the sun. And then you have uh, the full moon. We have, you know, that celebration, the full moon. All time, all time in all cultures, always, you know, began from the ritual of worship. Whatever God, polytheistic, many gods, or one God, or many gods. Even the Aztec, we went to Mexico, right? Same thing. They have their calendar based on their gods, the seasons. So the, if you live in the animistic or pantheistic world or uh, universe, everything is God. The wind, the water, the earth, and the fire is God. So you have to, and the Aztec, everything is a punish, punishment from God and they fear God. So many gods, you don't want to offend any gods, right? So they offer, they offer this season, you have to offer flour, this season you have to offer chicken, this season you have to offer, so they divide times in order to offer things to God, to atonement for whatever the offenses they have committed against the God. Any culture is that way. And around the world you go and you have a little temple, a little pagoda, a little shrines anywhere. And then during the time of Abraham, same thing. You know, he got a dream, Bethel, and he get a stone, set it up. Okay, this is the temple, this is a shrine for God, anywhere. God is everywhere, right? So when we talk about time, it has to do with worship. Now we get rid of God, so we're confused. Mm. Yeah? 
So time is uh, whatever you have on your iPhone. It has no meaning. Time used to have a lot of meaning. And the meaning meaning is about worshiping and sacrificing and um, and life and the um, the love for life and the hatred for death. Any kind of sacrifice is that, look, I'm going to kill that animal so I could live. I'm going to kill that animal offered to God so I could be forgiven my sins, right? So time has meaning. Profound meaning is now time has no meaning anymore. We waste time watching whatever show and uh, making money, which we cannot have. <laughs> yeah, learning trivials. Everything is trivial now. Trivial pursuit. No? And we, we get all those kind of information, but we never used it. So maybe we use it once in a while to impress people. I know this and you don't know, oh, you're so smart because you know more than. No, all this knowledge does not bring you to life or give you meaning. Yeah, so we talk about the time here. And so in the ancient um, time, olden days, even now around the world, time is of essence. And that's why when they report about the time, it is meaningful. But when we report about the time, sometimes it is it just, well, what time is it? Well, 11, 18. Yeah, it's it's very convenient and uh, we call it utilitarian or it's just useful, convenient. But when you say Sabbath, it's time. Sabbath, oh, atonement, sacrifice, death, sins. Yeah, atonement, all those things, forgiveness. So we, when they, they use the word Sabbath, it is so there are so many implications, layers and layers of uh, implications, and we have to think about it. Oh, Sabbath is the day that the Lord, the day of the Lord, the Lord has made. We rejoice and be glad because the Lord rests on that day. Sabbath means rest, Sabato, Sabato. Ah, resting, the seventh rest. When Sabbath was over, oh, oh, Mark said, Sabbath is over. That alone uh, make us stop and think. When Sabbath is over, the day of rest, the day of the Lord is over. Oh, what does it mean? Now, Let's take a look at the meaning here. The day of uh, Sabbath or the day when the Sabbath was over, okay? It, it is the day of rest. Sabbath is the day that uh, people don't do anything. People rest and resting like sleep, right? Sleep is like rest or death as well. And on that Passover, on Sabbath, lots of animals were killed and many humans were Executed. Hmm. When that day is over, means so much. So, the Sunday, the day of the Lord is over, that means you go back to work, isn't it? Monday is the day of work. The heaviest day of the week is Monday. Yeah, because you party too much. You go around, you know, you New York and Freedom Tower. <laughs> it's pizza and spaghetti and hot dogs. And you go, Monday, I have to go back to work. It's a day to work. So that alone, once the Sabbath was over, this is a new, new day for creation here. The eighth day, which is the first day of creation here. So, how did God create human being? So, you have the Sabbath here, okay? And you have the sixth day. Let's go. This is Sabbath, okay? Let's say the Sabbath here, right? And the sixth day here, creating human. Sabbath, now the first day, he is creating new humanity. Sixth day, old human, Sabbath. 
pass over new humankind. Human, on the sixth day, he took this dirt, mud, clay, formed it into his own image, and breathed into it, make male and female. On this day, somebody is lying inside the earth, and where's Eve? Three Marys, the church. You see that? Mary, Maryland, Mary, Mother of James and Solomon, all the women were there, and the church is there. The Eve, the new Eve, the new Eve is the church. So what is, uh, uh, what, what is uh, in the book of Genesis, what does it say about Eve here? Let's take a look at the book of Genesis, okay? Okay, um, how did he create human beings, okay? Uh, here we go. So what did he say? Okay. So the Lord has cast a deep sleep for a man on man. And while he was asleep, they took out his rib, uh, closed, uh, closed up its place with flesh. The Lord, is, the Lord God then built the rib that he had taken from the man into a woman. Uh, when he brought her to the man, he said, a man said, this is one. At last is bone, my bones, flesh, my flesh. This one shall be called woman. For out of man, this one has been taken. Okay. Now, hold on. What? Well, let us make what? Okay. Uh, what does he say here? Genesis one twenty six through. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. help mate. Yeah, help mate. The why is supposed to be the help mate, isn't it? That's what it's called. They call help mate. So the work is accomplished by the man, the head, and the church is supposed to be the help mate. The church does not save, but through whom or through which we receive salvation, the one that redeems that saves is the Christ, the new Adam. The church plays the role of the housewife or the helpmate. Okay, so we're reading spiritual meaning into this, only not even the whole sentence, okay? Not even the whole sentence. Right. When the Sabbath was over, that means no more resting. What's going to happen? Animals are slaughtered. Sacrifices were burned. Dead, the dead was buried. No? Yeah. And this dead criminal, Jesus of Nazareth, was buried three days already. So comes the first day of the week. Sabbath was over, Mary, Marilyn, the mother of James, and Salome. Now, we have the problem with this because many of the Protestants say mother of James is the G Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Not true, not true, not true. So the problem is, is you have uh, the list of Mark, Mary, Magdalene, Mary, mother of James, and Salome, three women, right? Yeah? And then... I say that Mary, mother of James, um, the, the Mary, the wife of Joseph, the Mary, that is the mother of James and Joseph, James and Joe and and Simon and the Jude, right? And the Mary, this Mary is the mother of Jesus. Not true, because you compare it to uh, the foot of a cross. You have Mary, Mary Magdalene, and Mary Clopas, right? Now here you have Mary Magdalene first, and you. Normally, they would not put Mary and Madeline before Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. He has a very special role. But people take this and they say that this is this proves that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is uh, the mother of the other boys and girls. Not true. Okay, we pay attention. So you see the women there. Okay. 
spices anoint him so now sabbath now becomes as it was supposed to be the day of rest because of the execution crucifixion of jesus christ sabbath has become the day of death not rest anymore hmm. sabbath has become the day of death no longer day of rest to prove that you have the spices now the details as you heard the, the bishop bishop baron said the details is, is um, just to prove that we like the details, the reality of the process of coming to faith, of discovering our faith. But the, this detail is, uh, has a meaning. This detail is pointing us to the reality that we do celebrate death. That's the biggest problem for many. Catholic Christians, we celebrate death. That's crazy. That's why we talk about the spices. What are the spices? For the myrrh? For the body. Now, suppose you get into the mind of these three, these three ladies, okay? Mary Magdalene, Mary, Mother of James, Mary Salome. In their mind, there was only death. In their mind, there were only the dead body of Jesus. He's dead, dead, dead. The proof is this. I'm bringing the spice. Because three days, you know, the process of decomposition, right? As a doctor, you know, the process of a decomposition. A, B, D, S, is that the process? No? Yeah, A, B, uh, th that's my uh, summarize, I'm summarizing of a. Uh, the process of um, decomposition. No, the body, the corpse. Do you, you cannot hear me, uh, Olivia? Sorry, I didn't. I was. I, I've not heard of that. The A B C of of decompos. The body. Um, yeah, I I would call it. Um, a B A B D S. So I wrote this one. I think I should uh, put in just for fun, for the sake of knowing when your body, when you're dead, how your body is going to decompose. Number one, you have the autolysis, autolysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have yes. that one. Yes. And then bloating, bloating means you're blowing up. All the gases. You're needing a lot of gases, bloating. Yes. I've yes. seen that in the hospital. So the yes. body is, you know, after you die, you know what's going to happen after your, your soul um, leaves your body. Or this is going to happen to your body. Right? Every, every, not just human corpse, but uh, animals as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, so autolysis, what is that? How, is that the, the right uh, enunciation? Autolysis. Yeah. Uh, autolysis. Uh -huh. Autolysis. There's no lice in, in the autolysis. It's, it's, just a simply, it's a breakdown. It's a breakdown. Breakdown. Just really, it's uh, consuming. You're eating your body. <laughs> the body's eating up. Yeah. And it, it, it so it moves to the second place. Uh, B A B uh, autolysis, and then bloating. You know, blowing up and emitting gas. And then you have the A D. The D is a come D a decay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, and then the um after. Oh, and then becomes, uh, oh, what do you call it? Uh, skeletonize. <laughs> you become a skeleton. Mm -hmm. Eat until you, you get tried up. Uh, mm -hmm. Your whole body dry up and you become a skeleton. No? This is like basic science. You know, you're studying biology, uh, physiology, physiology, uh, class of physiology. And normally we skip this. You know, too gruesome. And... But that's the whole thing. Sure. So 
you become bloated. You know, you you get bloated uh, three days, four days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And that's why you have the spice. Mm -hmm. You imagine that in this world is not like our world. They know, you know, they throw bodies on the street. Three days gonna blow and smells really bad. And everyone, you know, each of the women here, women, you know, women here, they got their own spice. First to protect their nose, second to <laughs> throw it up. In their mind, just a dead, dead, dead mind. Saturday, sabatos, sabas, death, rest is death, death is rest. And everybody was thinking about the death. They thought that they're going to kill him and it's going to stop everything, but still, death is still in their mind. That's the, the thing what, that, you know, just one version, a lot of things. And see the whole process. <sighs> so they have to get early, get up early and bought the spices in the market. They have to protect themselves. Uh, very early when the sun has risen on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb, crazy women. You should go to work, you go to the tomb. You become dirty, unclean. Huh? Well, Mary Merlin, you know, she is notorious for being a dirty woman already. These two ladies, why? Still, because in their mind, we want the dead body, bloated body of this man. Still, did they lose hope? We don't know. But still, they have love. You may lose hope, but you still have love. You, know, you see your child or somebody is already dead, but still you have love for that. You look at the love of the children and Maria when we go to pray for Kevin. The love is still there. Hope for him to, you know, the body to come back. No, no more hope. But that hope to raise the dead, to be raised from the dead is there. But the hope for that body to come back, the doctor is giving up, you know, no more. You can do no more, but still love is still there. Yes, Denise. So uh, I don't understand why they would be coming with spices when they had already closed the tomb. They put rolled the rock there and it was a very heavy rock. So there's no way that it could be opened, right? Without some man opening it. Did they expect for it to be opened? Did they- Oh, we are not raising those questions. We, we, the, we don't read their mind. We just read the Bible, the gospel. So when this report, what they did, okay, yeah. and the, the report is not what they they thought. So, so if the report said stated clearly what they thought, then it say what this is what they were thinking and saying. But you see, the report this is evidential, this factual that they did buy, they bought it spices. That's it, okay. And you could uh, speculate why did they buy it. Okay, now you could say, well, they wanted to put the spies on the body of Jesus because were they thinking that his body is bloating already? Well, they said the so man. that they might go and anoint him. But it okay. was understanding that Mary, the mother of Jesus, had already anointed his body when they no, wrapped no, the burial no, clothes. No, 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 no. Let's slow down. Okay. Slow down. Sorry. No, no, no. It's, don't be sorry. Just slow down. Slow down. You're, you're moving real quick. Jumping to a conclusion too quick. Okay. So before we um, we embalm the person, okay? So the person is dead. You could embalm person and um, embalm and um, put the spices. Three days later, you open the coffin. So you put more spice on it. Well, you could. Would it smell better three days before when you first die and three days later? Which day would smell worse? Three days later. Why do you put spice? Yeah. So 
the first day it smells right the body the body is dead and the, the person is it dead smells. you put the spice so you you know cover the smell the stench three days later it smells worse so you need the spice for this kind of smell you prepare yourself anticipate yourself either for yourself cover your nose right cover it or for that body and uh, why did they think they could anoint Jesus? We don't know. But the one thing is this. They anoint him. And it is not the living body, but the dead body of Jesus. That's where, what in their mind <laughs> is the body. You, should you anoint the living body? Yeah, Mary Magdalene did once. Right? Jesus was still alive. And was it a kind of a creature of habit? Mary Magdalene uh, could... We could name her the uh, the body anointer. You know, she just goes around and anoint <laughs> legs and heads and, and dead corpse. She would, could be a. Uh, I think she could become the patron of uh, perfume the makers. Mortis, you know. The morticians. <laughs> no, no, the mortician. She yeah. is the perfume maker. You know, oh, perfume maker. The, yeah, she she should be the the uh, the patron of the perfume. And like, even the dead body, bloating body, and you know, in their mind, that, that's it, three days, it's, it's slowly swelling up, bloating. Yeah? So you could annoy any time, every time you go to the, you know, you, now we have sprays, right? So we slow down, we slow down. We think slowly. Uh, yes, uh, uh, does that uh, respond to your uh, query, query, Denise? Yes. I still am uh, wondering if it was a if it was customary to go three days later and bring spices. No. Okay. Nobody does that. I don't understand then why they would do that. Nobody does that because these are crazy women. Yeah. See this here. This is crazy here. These people were trying to kill Jesus. Those who followed Jesus, the man who followed Jesus, was really being persecuted. Jesus was physically killed, and now these women come along. They're crazy, <laughs> out of their mind. And who, you know, uh, you just no more thinking. Okay, is it is it crazy or no? That after you bury your father, your mother, and three days later you dig up the grave and you anoint that, that corpse. Yeah. Do you do that? No. That's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. Crazy thinking. It's, uh, that doesn't make sense. But still, that's the reality. That's why Mark reported it. That all these early Christians, the first Christians, are crazy people. So are we. Just to say about the facts, the evidence, they did this. Was the reason? And so let me go back to the point here. They lost the hope of Jesus mm -hmm. living Amen. anymore. Okay, no more. No hope. But they still have the love. You understood? They get crazy because they do have the love for the man who is dead, crucified. So when you love somebody, you treat even the dead mob person as a living person. Remember my uh, nephew when the, his fish, pet fish died? Mm -hmm. Yes. And he performed a funeral for the dead fish. Yeah. And he was crying, right? And he had mm -hmm. the dead fish in his palm before he, you know, wash it into the toilet, right? Flush it in the toilet. And he's saying, mm -hmm. You are my sunshine. You are. My yeah. Sunshine. Yes. I have still had the film. It was crying, you are my sunshine. Still you, the dead fish. His friends, you know, who was growing up with the, the fish, has no brother, sister. Still the love for the fish still there. You are my sunshine and crying, crying. And we, we laugh at it. And he sees too old now. And I don't know if you still remember that. The love is there. The hope is no there, not there. But the love is there. So you treat the dead thing as living because you have the love. But there's still human love. Okay? There's love what explains many things. 
the crazy things we do because of love. And they love enough in order to risk their lives and to become filthy and clean to go to the tomb. So very early, uh, that's also a very dangerous thing, risky thing to do. When the sun has risen on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb. And then uh, the intention was to annoy. Sometimes, you know, when somebody you love so much living with you and they passed away, and a week later you still feel that they are still alive with you. Mm -hmm. yeah, really? You, you don't feel as if they're gone, really. They're there somewhere. And then you have, still have the same reaction when you think about that person. You could get mad at the, the dead person, you know, I'm so mad at you, what was it? Oh, he's dead already, she's dead already. Yeah, in our mind, he's still alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And so we do something, okay, um, uh, just like um, for the other Father Peter passed away, right? And so uh, I would drink coffee and I thought about making coffee for him and oh, he's dead already for months. And I, oh, he was eating uh, ramen noodle. And then we turn around, he's not there anymore. But still, you know, we have the, the portion for him. Oh, we forgot he's gone. We still make for him. Because of the, the brotherhood, the family thing. Yeah? And then now whenever I sit, oh, he's sitting face to face with me. Yeah? Uh, across me. That table, that place still there. So it's really still alive. And then this is human, okay? It's not spiritual. It's not, it's not the risen Lord yet. So they, they did that as a creature of habit. They, got the spies, maybe for themselves, maybe for Jesus. They came to the tomb, and then by the moment they walk on the way, oh, we bring this to anoint his body. But nobody's going to roll the stone for us. The stone is too large. And we did go to the tomb of Jesus in mm -hmm. Israel, didn't we? Yes. In the Holy Land. Yes. The tomb is big. Yeah. We build the church over the tomb, right? And we will build the church over the church. Yeah? And we will build the chapel, two, three chapels over the place where they crucified Jesus. And the large church over the whole Gogotha, the mountain. There are many churches inside that. So you, you go there, you see the tomb is really big. You could sleep in there. And some people came in there and slept and uh, stay awake, you know, be, be uh, vigil for, for all night long. It's big, mm -hmm. really big tomb. And you imagine there's a rock covering it. it is one man, I don't think, would be able to roll it. Who's going to roll? And then so this is the report verbatim to Mark. And Mark wrote it down verbatim. What they thought, what they did, what they said. The details are important. Just to put the stress on the reality that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, is dead, really dead. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Okay? And we celebrate it. You don't need to believe that Jesus is dead. We know he's dead. Everybody knows he's dead. Make sure that he's dead. And people keep saying he's dead. And nobody says that he's more dead than the Catholics. Okay? Get it down. No need to have faith in his death. And we celebrate it. And no, somebody says he's not dead, that they're lying. All the evidence, all the witnesses, okay, points toward the death of Jesus Christ, historical records, and every single detail is, of, is about his death, his death. And then something happened. They were thinking and talking to each other who was going to roll the stone. They look up, that means they were going, going up the hill, didn't they? We did go up the hill, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we reach it 
we go into the uh, the church of Holy Sepulchre. Yeah, we look up, we were discussing, imagine you were the three women discussing your bringing the spies. Who's going to roll the stone of the tomb for us? Who is crazy enough to roll the stone of the tomb? And they were thinking of the crazy thing. No man would do that. No soldier would do that. As the Sanhedrin, as the Roman soldiers, as the apostles, the men, no one would do that. If you even you pay money for them to roll it, they won't smell. Except when Jesus said, do it. They say, okay, a week before, remember? A week before this Sabbath, the Passover, Jesus went to Bethania, Bethany. He said, roll the stone. Remember, didn't he? Yes. Lazarus. Lazarus, roll the stone. Jesus said the word, and the stone will roll. People helped. Now the women, who is going to roll the stone for us? They say the word, but this time is nobody rolling the stone. Jesus himself rolled the stone. Mm. It's open. They saw the stone had been rolled back. Every single detail say something about the death of Jesus. He's dead. No doubt about it. No need to have faith in that. And it was very large. Mm -hmm. Jesus born poor and died rich. Yeah. He was born in a stable and manger and now he died in a rich man's tomb. That's why the stone is large. You cannot escape this detail. Which would you like to be? Born poor and die rich? Or mm -hmm. born rich and die poor? Which one? Mm -hmm. Yes, Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, follow your know, disciple Jesus. Follow him. You know, I'm gonna born, be born poor and I'm gonna die rich like Jesus. Yeah. That means nothing. Well, the borrow, borrow tomb, right? back. Big, large, very large uh, stone. Okay. Uh, there's something that's more, even more crazy. Hell, going early in the morning when the sun rises, going to the market, get the spies, and going to anoint the, the dead body who is bloating, uh, which is bloating right now. And then they ride, they enter the tomb crazy. They entered the tomb. Has anybody ever dig a grave? No. No. Has no. anybody jump into the grave? No. no. These women get into the tomb and we did go into the tomb, Jesus, didn't we? Yes. Yeah, we did. Um, yes. On entering, saw they saw the men sitting on the right side. So now, so you go into the tomb, okay? And the tomb, and then there's a sarcophagus, right? On mm -hmm. the right-hand side. And so it's like this, and on the right-hand side, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw it for you. So we have a picture, but not a perfect picture. Okay, so okay, I'm going to draw something like this, okay? From the bird views, this is okay. So now, so you see this one. So you yes. go to the tomb here. There's a the the door here. Okay, you enter, and this is the puffagus here. That's why they like Jesus. Mm -hmm. And you enter here. Okay, and uh, we celebrate Mass on the tomb, right? Um, so the young man is going to sit on the right-hand side, should be here. And the cloth is going to be here, the head here. Or the cloth is going to be at the foot. If the right-hand side, the man is sitting on the right-hand side of the tomb, it should be this way. Because mm -hmm. you enter here, and you see here. So the three women... One, two, three, they enter and they see the man sitting. Okay, entering into this other young man sitting on the right side of the tomb, sitting here. Right? 
And they were amazed, early amazed. We are here, we've heard, we thought that we were going to be the first. Now there's a man sitting there. And the man is not Jesus. <laughs> Strange. Everything is shocking. Really. Everything is shocking. Man, who are you? And he opens his mouth and says, do not be afraid. Do not be amazed. And he even read their mind. You're seeking for Jesus Nazareth. Shocking, shocking, shocking. The one, and then the specified, uh, this man say, okay, number one, you're looking for Jesus, right? Number one, don't be amazed, don't be afraid. Second, you're looking for Jesus, Nazareth. And the third one, the crucified one. Very specific. There are many Jesus, but the crucified one, there's only one. The dead one, you're looking for the dead one. Then the word crucified, it, see, it, it, uh, it hits the nail on the head. The specific way that he died, he, you know, this man put the emphasis on the death of Jesus Christ in a very specific way. Death by crucifixion, the crucified one. It means he's dead, really dead. Then the twist he has been raised. And not here. That is hard to believe. No, 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 no. I, I believe because I witnessed, uh, you know, he'd been being tortured and uh, carried the cross and and crucified and died and pierced in the side. And we helped uh, entombed him and bombed him and anointed him and put him in a tomb, right? Mm -hmm. those, are, those make sense. We're okay with it. The crucified, we understand. We're seeking Jesus, that's true. Yeah, we're amazed and afraid, that's true. But what do you mean raised? What do you mean he's not here? They don't believe. And behold, the place we, where, where they laid him and go tell the disciples, so, did the woman believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? Yes or no? Yes. Did they believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? You have to think slowly. Now, the thing they could believe is that, number one, Jesus was dead, crucified, entombed, right? He was entombed and bombed. They come to anoint him with the spices. Those could is believable. But the, the, the fifth fact is this. The tomb is empty. The body is lost. That's what they can believe in. They believe that. And they came home. They reported. We looked for him. The tomb is empty. Couldn't find his body. What is the explanation now? When you have the vacuum... When you have something that is missing, we tend to put in our own interpretation. Stolen. Yeah. Stolen. A man just walked out of the tomb, raised from the dead. Impossible. But we can believe that the tomb is empty. Nobody could deny the fact that the tomb is empty. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> How did you do that? <laughs> the tomb is empty. Yes. I can believe it, but he's raised from the dead. They, they, you know, do you believe somebody, a stranger telling you that he's raised from the dead? We don't know who you are. And he went back to Galilee ahead of you and you go tell the disciples. The women would report exactly as it, but do they really believe Jesus raised from the dead? Well, we don't um, know. Well, according Which to- Which assume that they do. 
assume that we do. That they, we assume that they do, but we don't know. They do believe that the tomb is empty. We, they do believe that the body of Jesus is, is, uh, is lost, right? But they won't believe it until Jesus appeared to them. They can say, okay, I believe in what you say, but not I believe because I know. They believe because they don't know. They, they, they listen to this man, the stranger here. They went back to the disciples. They told them they don't believe. Nobody believed. If Peter and John were to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, they would not run to the tomb and take a look for themselves. What they believe is that the, um, the tomb is empty and the body of Jesus is lost. So they still have hope. They don't have faith, but they have hope. Hope, not faith. That moment is hope. Yeah? Both, you know, exciting. You know, we don't know. But we hope because the lady said that he's, you know, the, this man told them that he's raised. We hope that's true, but we cannot believe it. We hope it's true. We hope it is true. But that hope has to be verified. So the process of believing is, is uh, not complicated, but is realistic. Yes, Denise, you raised your hand. So, I okay, so we're talking about only Mark right now, right? Yeah, Not we're reading the text right now from Mark. Okay. So because um, there is another version that says they went to Peter and John and told them that they've stolen the, the body. No, no, no. That's different. That the Sanhedrin, the, uh, the priests, Jewish priests say that. Well, Mary Magdalene stayed outside the tomb weeping and she wept. So this is John. Yeah. And she said that uh, they have taken Jesus and she doesn't yeah. know who he is. And yeah. then she says, and then he calls her name and then she's bleeding. Yeah. So that means uh, in the mind of Mary Magdalene, according, so you put them together. Okay. So Mark said, this man told Mary Magdalene and the other two ladies that he's raised from the dead. is not here. Okay. And suppose that happens before. And all the women went back and tell everybody. Okay, and Mary Magdalene still there crying, crying, crying. That they took away the body of my Lord, right? Mm -hmm. So she did not believe. Right. If she were to believe and she would go, you know. But then, so this, you have to see the sequence here. First, she went there into the tomb. The man said, he's raised, it's not here. And Mary did not immediately go back to tell Peter and John. She stayed there and cried and cried and cried until Jesus said uh, uh, something. And she did not look up because she was down, didn't look up. Right. right? And then uh, she was looking at his feet and said, okay, uh, did you take the body of my Lord, right? And Jesus said, Mary, Mariam, okay, and said, Rabuni. Hear the sound, not the sight. The sight would not make you believe, but the sound of your name. And then that is not the faith without seeing. That's the faith is touching faith, hearing faith, you know, seeing faith. All human, you know, a well-rounded experience. And then she would go back, run back, and tell Peter and John and the apostles, the, the 11, that she saw him. She spoke with him. Nobody believed. Yeah? So the process, we put them together, it means that way. You're correct, Denise? Okay? So you see the process of uh, discovering faith is a process. Discovering yourself. And you get to know yourself, what you are. It, it, it's an internal, in, internal process. It's deeper than just, oh, really? uh, we believe. The empty tomb means Jesus is risen from the dead. These people struggled. They don't just see and believe. No, no. And, and, and no, no, no. And that's the whole process of reasoning right there. Reason, reasoning with facts and evidence and witnesses. Even the witnesses 
we don't believe in witnesses. With, uh, you know, witnesses are not strong enough. Even the angel, the young man told them, oh yeah. And then Mary Magdalene and the women came back, no. How many witnesses? You only need two. These are the four or three women. Oh, the women, we don't believe. And even Peter and John came to the tomb. So now for Peter to hope, and he doesn't know, but John saw the empty tomb, he believed. So it's a decision. Yeah, you could stay within hope that Jesus is risen, or you could just believe he is risen. John said that, you know, John, he believed. Immediately, he saw the empty tomb. For him, we are like John, okay? We, we know there's the empty tomb. We saw the empty tomb. We believe because that is a conscious decision because he heard Jesus said so. And he heard the lady said so. And he made a decision to believe that he's risen. So believe is not out of nowhere without an objective. We say, I believe. You just go around and say, I believe, I believe. No, no. I believe. Here. Not just believe, but I declare. I proclaim Christ Jesus is dead. He's risen. He's come again. He's coming again. That is the faith, the doxology, the proclamation. You cannot just say, I believe that he's risen without saying he's dead. Okay? The mystery of faith at, uh, at Mass, right? The mystery of faith, and you respond. Christ has died. Christ has risen. No, that's that the old one. version. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the, one of the, the first we one. Believe, we proclaim your death, O Lord. Your death, O Lord, until he, he comes again. And then the second one is save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. And then the third one is when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Okay, so that's that's it. That's the mystery of faith in the Mass. That's the kind of a, a synopsis summary of, of our faith, not just in the resurrection, but the death and the coming again of Jesus. Okay, so now. What is the point? We tend to focus on the resurrection and the whole thing about uh, Protestantism is about the resurrection. Many churches now get it of the crucifix. We just put the cross there just like a Protestant church. Yeah, we believe we are the uh, resurrection people. It's not untrue. But why did the church, right after the resurrection of the Lord, the church for thousands of years from the beginning of time, the beginning of the, you know, um, the apostolic time, we go back immediately to the Eucharist. Huh. Immediately Eucharist. And you'll see the series of readings. Oh, they hope that Jesus is risen from the dead. They heard the report that Jesus is risen from the dead. And they heard the report that somebody stole the body. They heard the report from the women that they saw Jesus, met Jesus, these crazy women, right? But then they still hope. But the moment they recognize that Jesus is truly risen is when he breaks bread. That's it. The Catholic Church goes back to the Last Supper, to the Holy Thursday. Every time the priest celebrates Mass, he's <clears throat> celebrating Last Supper. The only time people recognize that Jesus is risen is when he celebrates the Mass, the breaking of the bread. Why? Yeah, that's the question. And we celebrate the death and the resurrection. You could go to any other you know, Christian church and celebrate the, yeah, or rugged cross and uh, resurrection of Christ, but we celebrate the Eucharist. You, you see it, 
and the two disciples, uh, Cleophas and the Emos, right? And uh, on the beach, every time Jesus break bread, break bread, break bread. Oh, that's Jesus. That's Jesus, the risen one. Yes. So now, somehow, we have to go to, uh, we have to connect the risen Lord with the Eucharist. Because that's what Paul preached. That's what Peter and all the apostles preached. Eucharist. After the consecration, the mystery of faith, when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O oh Lord. Until you come again. Mm -hmm. I am going to leave you hanging because he's going before you to Galilee, his hometown, not really home, his workplace. You will see him there on the beach, baking, roasting the fish and baking the bread, preparing the Eucharist for you. We do have hope. We have to choose to believe. But hope is always there. Okay, I'm going to end here and I'm going to go work. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. All right. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, Father and to the Son, to the Son and to the Holy, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. As, it, As was, it was in the beginning, is now, now and, and ever shall be. be. World well, without and and amen. Okay, this is a final thought before we part, okay? And before the blessings. Who's going to roll the stone for us? <laughs> this idea has been floating around for a long time. Everybody has a very large stone covering mm -hmm. your tomb and you have been hidden or locked in your tomb for a long time from inside. I was going to roll your stone. What is your stone? here? The Lord be with you. And with, and with your and spirit. spirit. The Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Father. That Thank was you, very good. Thank you, Father. Thank you. God bless have you all. Safe, Happy have Easter. Have a safe trip.